you know, I must have a death wish. The idea I'm going to discuss the nature of time with one of our leading physicists in, you know, in the world. Uh, you know, clearly, I must be either fearless or mad. We do know a lot more about time than maybe some of the philosophers might argue we do. And there's nothing in physics and nothing in philosophy which, chooses be which can choose between them. Zeno is trying to say, it's not that time doesn't exist, but that humans haven't yet learned how to articulate it in a way that makes it possible. Zeno was an idiot. We can say a lot more about what time really is. We need to rescue time from the jaws of physics if we're going to see it aright. How should we make sense of time? Is it a dimension, a flow, a place, a process, a social construct, or something altogether more mysterious? That's a heck of a kickoff question. I could spend the whole hour on that one. Uh, we're going to hear first from Jim Al Khalili, a professor of theoretical physics at the University of Surrey, presenter of Radio 4's finest science program at 9 a.m. <laughs> on Tuesday. Oh. <laughs> Not to be confused with 4.30 Thursdays repeated 9 p.m. Mondays, the material one, <laughs> and author of the just published Paradox, which he manages to tweet about on an almost hourly basis. <laughs> For many people, the common sense view is that we don't know what time is. Um, and uh, the common sense view is, is, is actually what goes back to Isaac Newton. And, and for many people who haven't taken a course in relativity theory, we think we haven't progressed from there. So there's this cosmic clock that ticks by the seconds, the minutes, the hours at the same rate for everyone. Uh, and although we have our own, own subjective view of time, that if, if you're enjoying this hour, it'll go by very quickly. If you're bored, you know, the time will, will drag. But you know that's Fo the way... Focus on the former. Focus on the former, absolutely. <laughs> well, th there's no danger. But we know that's our own subjective view of time. Actually, in 1905, Einstein published his special theory of relativity where he showed that that view of time is wrong. Time isn't an absolute. It's not something abstract, something that we have invented or something that we have no control over. Time is m m more tangible than that. It's tangible in, this, in the way that space is tangible. Now, in space, we know we, we have access to three dimensions of space, and we can move forwards and backwards, up and down, left and right. In time, we are constrained to moving in one direction. So we think, in, 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 certainly in physics, as time as having an arrow, a direction. I remember one of my um, finest moments was when I was doing my PhD and I was looking up some, some, some papers in the, in the University Library and I came across one of Stephen Hawking's papers, so this is mid-80s, uh, and uh, where he talks about the arrows of time and the direction of time and how can you define the direction of time? Is past and future just something we've invented? Um, and actually, in his paper, there are several definitions of time and, and he then goes on to point out that one way of defining time is in the direction in which the universe is expanding. So the past Forget human memory. What if humans had never evolved? Why, what if there was no life in the universe? Would there still be time? Yes, of course, there would be time. It's part of the fabric of what the universe is, the, the, um, space-time, as, as Einstein calls it. Uh, and so Hawking said, well, if we define the direction of time as going from the Big Bang onwards, so the Big Bang, smaller universe, is in the past, the direction of time is the direction of the expansion of the universe. But if our psychological arrow of time, the way we think of part, remembering the past and looking to the future, is in the same direction as that, how would we know if the universe is actually contracting? Maybe the universe is getting smaller, but it's because our arrow of time is always pointing in the direction of expansion of time. And, and the first two or three pages of this paper I followed, and then he got into the maths. And Stephen Hawking's maths wasn't the same as my maths. It, it depends on what area of physics you're in. And I lost him there. But I was aware that he'd made a mistake about the arrow of time. And I remember making some notes. And then remember a few years later reading Brief History of Time where he conceded he'd made a mistake. And I remember reading this on the train and smiling, grinning to myself that I, I proved somehow that Stephen Hawking had made, made a mistake. But, but it points to the fact that even modern uh, physics doesn't really understand quite how time fits into to our theories of, of, of the universe. Relativity theory tells us that time can be 
squeezed and stretched. There's no absolute time. Time depends on the observer. If, if two people are traveling at, at high speed relative to each other, close to the speed of light, they will measure time at flowing at different rates. They will see each other's clocks running slower. There is no absolute present now. It depends on your frame of reference. And yet, the other great theory of modern physics, quantum mechanics, doesn't really describe time in, in this more complete way. In quantum mechanics, time is just what's called a parameter. It's just a way of ensuring how things change, cranking the handle from past to future. And, and one of the big questions in modern physics is how do we reconcile Einstein's theory of relativity with quantum mechanics? Because until then, we won't have a correct theory of time. But we do know a lot more about time than maybe some of the philosophers might argue we do. It, it is much more than psychological time. It's much more than just how we care to define it. There's an absoluteness to time, according to Einstein, that exists whether or not humans care to pontificate and philosophize about it. Jim, thank you very much for your brief history of Hawking's brief theory of time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that moment we all love when we find Hawking's wrong. I mean, oh, we've all, we've all enjoyed that. I did say it was, my, it was my finest moment. It was your <laughs> finest moment. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, next, we come to Ray Tallis, physician, philosopher, poet, novelist, bon viveur, fashion icon Monke. Ray, Ray is author of Michelangelo's Finger and the Kingdom of Infinite Space, but for the next hour he is bounded in this nut's hell. <laughs> oh yes, lovely. You know, I must have a death wish. The idea I'm going to discuss the nature of time with one of our leading physicists in, you know, in the world. Uh, you know, clearly I must be either fearless or mad. But anyway, I've got to disagree with Jim as well, so it indicates that I'm probably mad as well as fearless. The truth is, I don't know what time is, but I know what it isn't, and I know what it doesn't. And I want to spend my four minutes focusing on the hapless metaphor of the arrow of time, and to argue that it's about time that time's arrow was put back into its quiver. <laughs> I think it's an unhelpful metaphor, and it's based on a deep-rooted and revealing misunderstanding of the nature of time. The arrow of time metaphor, coined by Arthur Eddington, by the way, very great uh, astronomist, astrophysicist, is a response to the notion that time has a direction. The idea that it flows or moves in a certain way, and particularly that it moves forwards rather than sideways or backwards. And this notion is reinforced, I think, by the way in science we represent moments as occupying locations in a dimension, a dimension usually marked T, so that time will seem when it's represented like a growing line. And this licenses a variety of daft questions, one of which that J Jim referred to and, 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 and put it aside, for example, how fast is time moving? What is it growing into and how fast is it growing? And we both of us would agree that is, a, for all sorts of reasons, a non-question. Now, of course, representing time as a line that's growing is a very useful way of representing the unfolding of events in physics. As witness, its value uh, in, in, in uh, the science we've all benefited from over the last, in the post-Galilean era and uh, the science to which people like Jim have contri contributed enormously. But I think it's important not to muddle this way of representing time with time itself. For a start, it tempts us to think of time as analogous to space, hence all that stuff about time travel, all of which is uniform nonsense. Making time a dimension doesn't, of course, necessarily spatialize it, and many phys physicists would deny that we are spatializing time by making it a dimension on all, on all fours with the three dimensions of space. But it does render time vulnerable to be conceived spatially, vulnerable to space-like metaphors, such as the arrow of time. Because after all, poor old time is only one dimension, but there are three dimensions of space, so it's outnumbered. It arrives, if you like, like d'Artagnan, <laughs> adding, uh, adding on to the three musketeers. So it's really got to you know, follow the party line. Despite these problems, there have been efforts to give the notion of the arrow of time a scientific respectability. In other words, to, uh, to see what in s physical terms would underpin the notion that time has a direction. And that's by trying to find irreversible processes in the universe. And this is a bit awkward, because most of the basic laws of the universe are time reversible. There's no reason why things should go one way rather than another. Can we please thank our extremely well-tempered temporal panel, Angela, Craig, Ray, Jim. Thank you.